fellow Italians and guests, uh, our speaker today was born in Ukraine. She came to the United States in 1998 to go to graduate school. She earned her doctorate at Cornell. She's currently associate professor of sociology at OSU Marion. She resides in Powell with her husband. Please give a warm rotary welcome to Dr. Mariana Klotschko. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here and appreciate the invitation. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, would like to see peace and uh, I'm not doing bazookas or high mars or javelins or bayraktars, but I do this and so this is my contribution to, to global peace and prosperity, or so I hope, right? Um, so uh, today I would like to speak uh, about Russian war and aggression. Uh, it has been going on for uh, more than six months, more than uh, 200 days. And I will focus on what is going on now, um, what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Uh, but since this is the organization of action and change, I also would like to talk about what we can do uh, and how we can help and how we can make a difference. So um, I entitled my presentation Russian War and Aggression because it's important to see uh, and to understand the, the, the rhetoric and to use the proper words for what's going on. Um, for a while in the media we would hear things like war in Ukraine or Ukrainian war and I just would like to highlight that it's not Ukrainian war. Uh, Russia started this war in unprovoked fashion. Uh, it's, it's a Russian aggression, it's Russian war, um, not Ukrainian war. But Ukrainian are fighting for their lives and they're fighting, um, fighting for their freedom. Oh, so we hope yeah. to change. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. So, um, where does this Russian aggression comes from? Uh, just a quick note, obviously I'm not going to go, you could have the whole hours of lectures on the subject of history, but if you are a student of history and if you're interested to know, I would, I would highly recommend reading on the subject because the Russian aggression is not new. Many people might be watching the news and thinking, oh my God, what's going on? Why is this happening? It has been happening for the, at least last 350 years. Uh, this is how Russia has been treating Ukraine for that loan as part of the imperial aggression, part of the imperial acquisition and colonization of the lands. And that's precisely why it seems like Russians don't care about uh, saving people because they care about the acquisition of the land and resources, but uh, not about people necessarily. Um, and if you're interested in reading more on the subject of history in this past 350 years, I could recommend some uh, really cool authors. Um, this uh, slide comes from uh, the Study of War website, and they have Facebook presence and they have regular uh, website presence, and I would highly recommend that. They have day-by-day -day, uh, maps of Ukraine, what's going on um, on a regular basis there. Uh, and uh, you can see here in, in red uh, the um, striped part is the Russian control um, Ukrainian territory since February 24th of this year. And then without the, the stripes across, this is the territory that Russia had acquired since February 24th. And the blue color means the territory that Ukraine had been taken back. And happy to report, this is as of a uh, couple days ago. Uh, I'm from Kharkiv myself, so the city that has been uh, shelled uh, continuously every single day uh, since uh, the 24th of February. And Kharkiv uh, region has been taken back. Uh, so there's this massive offensive that's, uh, that's going on, uh, and so I would hope that momentum continues. But ever more so, even though we are in the offensive, uh, the, the help is needed, obviously, because the, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of ammunition to be successful. So at your own leisure, visit the Institute for the Study of War. They have a lot of interesting info uh, graphics on the subject. Uh, the war uh, is not a, a fun event, obviously. Uh, it is 
dangerous, it is painful, it is destructive, um, and both people uh, and land and buildings and culture are being destroyed. Um, these numbers are somewhat outdated, uh, maybe by a, a couple months or so, but I just wasn't able to find you know, better uh, infographics on the subjects. To just add a few uh, hundreds and thousands to uh, to the number. So I wanted to touch on some of the key issues of what um, Russia is doing, uh, how it's violating uh, all of the conventions that has to do with the way how you're supposed to have uh, war activities since the World War II. Um, so as you could see, a lot of these articles of Geneva and Hague conventions, they're all coming from late 40s, um, early or mid 50s of 20th century, and Russia is violating every single, um, every single one of them. Um, so, uh, murdering people, um, uh, attacking civilians, uh, Russian troops have destroyed more than 120,000 civilian infrastructure facilities, and that includes power plants, uh, the schools, variety of residential buildings, and, you know, theoretically, it's not supposed to be happening. Um, this is my city of Kharkiv. The top picture is uh, before the shelling in February, the bottom picture is after. Uh, this uh, big building on the left is the, uh, uh, the, the regional uh, power authorities. Uh, this is the, and the building now is, would be here where you sit, and it's overlooking one of the largest squares uh, in Europe, and so this is the level of destruction that we see in, in many cities uh, across Ukraine, especially the eastern and southern part. Um, so this is Irpin, this is Kiev uh, suburb, uh, and this is not too far from infamous Bucha, where we've learned about a lot of the uh, violation of human rights, torture, rape, um, and, and mass murder of, uh, of civilians. Russian troops also damaged more than um, 2,400 educational institutions, which puts, of course, the start of the new academic year in jeopardy. Uh, this is the first day of school in my hometown um, in metro station that is really close to where I used to live. So I, I saw the picture, I was like, oh, I remember just being there waiting for the train to come. Um, would I want to start my academic year sitting in metro station because of the shelling? No, no student want to be in that position. Uh, but this is the reality. Uh, so there's basement fortifications, there's uh, all of the windows are covered with sandbags, uh, and some parents choose not to send their children because they're afraid for, afraid for their safety. And the sad part um, is that my social feed on Facebook, this is what my feed looks like. I see people, and especially children, um, without legs, without arms, uh, the, the shelling and pieces of shrapnel in their faces, disfigured, uh, their dreams shattered, uh, and many lives, of course, taken. And I'm just thinking, this this is the society that has this great deal. Obviously, there is a there is psychological damage and trauma, but also physical damage. How many people lost their limbs? How many children who had technically their their whole life in front of them, and they're dealing with this? And you know, this girl, she ended up in the U.S. and she got the bionic hand, but not every kid gets to come to the US or the Western European society to get um, really good quality prosthetics. So how many of them could not get this, this kind of quality things? And so this is kind of one of the avenues that we could potentially help uh, to, um, to, to send money to those uh, places in Ukraine that make those prosthetics and help the, uh, the people to lead maybe more uh, active lives comparing to what they might be having otherwise. Um, a lot of cities are uh, destroyed, and since the beginning of the shelling, the Russians uh, fired at least 2,800 missiles on the cities and town. And we also have to be mindful of environmental destruction. Uh, so you're polluting air, you're polluting soil, you have landmines, uh, you have uh, potentially threatening the nuclear um, plants, which could affect not just obviously immediate proximity of where they stand, uh, but also the rest of the population um, in, in, in Europe and, and environs. And uh, Russians also take hostages 
uh, and they engage in torture, and you all probably heard about Bucha and what was going on there, but unfortunately it's not just one town or one city, but everywhere Russians go there is uh, torture involved. You probably heard about um, uh, the Mariupol defenders, and when they surrendered, then part of them were taken to a settlement called Alenivka, where they have been tortured, they were castrated, and then they were shot point blank. Uh, even though supposedly the Red Cross uh, had promised the security of the transfer of the, of the prisoners of war, but apparently Russia disregards this kind of uh, agreements, unfortunately. And this is just one episode that, that they, everywhere they come, they tend to torture both uh, the prisoners of war as well as civilian population. Um, and taking hostage also of pretty much everybody else by taking over the nuclear, uh, not necessarily nuclear weapons, which they have, uh, but nuclear plants like the one in Zaporizhia that you probably heard a lot about lately as the UN sends special um, uh, commission to uh, estimate what the situation is like there and the degree of danger that it poses. Another issue with the way how Russians carry the war um, is that it tends to engage in unlawful de deportation, forcefully taking people away from Ukraine to Siberia and other parts of Russia. And that unfortunately brings a lot of the deja vu and painful uh, PTSD for uh, many uh, uh, many Ukrainians because that has been during Stalin times, uh, during Tsarist times, that's what Russia tended to do with the dissidents uh, and kind of moving people en masse to Siberia and most of them would perish on on the way and then the large majority would, would perish while in, in the labor camps there. And so it's kind of repetition of the past uh, that's happening right now and so it's a great deal of trauma for people who are um, involved, unfortunately. Um, another focus that Russia takes is the damage. I, I mentioned damage of a lot of properties of um, educational institutions, but also they target uh, churches, they target museums on purpose, because part of it, uh, you destroy uh, humans physically, but you also destroy the culture. And one of the ways to do it is to burn the books uh, to destroy the buildings where the objects of culture are housed, uh, like, like museums, like, like the churches. Um, and last but not least, uh, you have probably aware about the massive raping that has been going on of, of both women and, uh, and children. There's a lot of conversation that have been intercepted between the uh, Russian military and their family members where they're boasting uh, the rapes uh, that they are engaging in and again rapes as well uh, and this is, is being documented and currently uh, a lot of those violations of the Geneva and Hague Convention are being collected for future trials um, if if we get to the point where we could get those people to the international court then maybe they will answer but that does not really help at this point the victims uh, victims of this of this crimes uh, and here it takes me to kind of the next step where uh, we really need to be mindful of how we respond and what we do, uh, knowing that if we do nothing, that just helps evil to uh, proliferate. And make no mistake, uh, Russians are evil, Russia is evil, um, there is no gray zone here, uh, there, is a, there is evil and, and good, there is unfreedom and freedom, uh, and we need to make a clear distinction, there is no dancing around it. Um, this is how uh, Ukraine um, has been um, dealing with Russian aggression, the latest bout of it started in 2014. The war didn't start in 2022, it started in 2014. But in 2014, no one did anything. Even after Russians downed the plane, uh, the, the Dutch plane, and there were massive casualties, Macron, Merkel, um, United States, Great Britain, um, everyone engaged in this kind of appeasement, dancing around, a variety of negotiations that led to nowhere. And I would venture to say that if we acted in accord in 2014, we might have prevented this great damage of the land, the people, and massive psychological trauma. The escalation might have been avoided had we done something, not just ignored it. Because what Putin saw in 2014 and subsequent years is that nobody cares, that the West is weak, that they cannot unite, which you know, hopefully we 
uh, changed in 2022, but it would have been nicer, would have been more proactive and more effective if we did that same thing in 2014. Um, and so currently, as a result, uh, Ukraine is paying in blood for, for democracy, for freedom, for the for the for their life of people and for um, and, and for the peace. And the least we can do is to support these efforts, uh, support these efforts so that I would venture to say Ukraine would win. And this is uh, one of the ideal outcomes that we should be going for. Because the only way to achieve peace, as I mentioned earlier, that I'm, I'm thinking I'm contributing to peace, is that uh, for Ukraine to win. Because if Russia gets to win, it will not stop. It will continue to engage uh, in further violent activities. Uh, the next is probably going to be Azerbaijan, Moldova, maybe some of the Baltic countries. It will not stop. Uh, so even if one negotiates with Russia, as I would not understand why would you do that, because obviously Putin cannot be trusted to sign a piece of paper. Uh, but it is very important uh, to keep on going and to make sure that Ukraine wins. Uh, it secures the, the, the region and peace in the region as well. Uh, uh, it obviously secures the survival of, uh, of Ukrainian people. Here, what comes to mind is a uh, famous quote by Golda Meir, the, the Prime Minister of Israel, who said that they want us to negotiate with our enemies. Uh, our enemies want us dead, uh, and we want to leave. And there is not much room of negotiation there. The same situation that, that we see currently between Russians uh, and Ukrainians. This is a little bit materialistic, but Ukraine does provide at least 10% of grain to the world. And lately, you might have heard about the harvest, uh, heroic attempts that uh, Ukrainians pull to harvest uh, the wheat and barley uh, and to start shipping those uh, across, the, across the Black Sea. And so if uh, Ukraine wins, then uh, it can continue to supply food to the world. Uh, additionally, it's not just between Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine stands for self-determination, for freedom. Uh, and one of the things that Putin is so upset about is that he cannot wrap his mind around people wanting to be free of him, free of Russia, to self-determine their destiny. He also cannot wrap his mind uh, with this notion of somebody serves as a president and then they go away and the next person comes. That there isn't a president that serves for 30 years onward until they die, like a dictator or um, like someone who is a member of totalitarian regime. So to him, it's just uh, abomination. Ukraine represents something that uh, he hates a great deal and he cannot understand. Uh, and so what he cannot understand, he must destroy. Um, and, and so in, in winning, uh, we not only preserve the land and the people of Ukraine, or at least whatever is left of the people of Ukraine, but we also um, maintain and reaffirm the values for which we stand, the values of uh, freedom, the, the values of law and international law and its enforcement, and the values of cooperation between the democracies. Um, lastly, we also need to be mindful that for Russia, maybe to have a chance to become a normal country that lives with the rule of law, that joins maybe the pantheon of democratic uh, countries, it needs to lose. Because if it does not lose, like Germany did in, in the World War II, it will not reconcile the wrongs that, that they, they did to, to the world and to Ukraine uh, specifically. And it will not have an incentive to change. So that's very important to happen. So how can we get this to uh, fruition? Well, obviously, continuing to supply good quality military um, uh, and also quantities, especially now that the offensive is being successful. Um, Ukrainian army goes through ammunition like there's no tomorrow. So you need more ammunition. Obviously, high Mars and javelins, um, the enemy targets those as well, so they get to be destroyed. And unfortunately, we as the world, we were not prepared for this. So we need to bump up the production um, you know, for us and also for our allies. Um, we also need to provide some serious defense uh, systems uh, better than what we've been doing so far, including fighter jets. Uh, and train, if necessary, Ukrainian military, and they're really quick learners there. Uh, and I know this is expensive, uh, and there's price attached to every single item that we send to help Ukraine, but it's just tanks. It's just the money. 
Ukrainians are paying for this in, in their own blood, in blood of the children and, and the destroyed future. So we need to be mindful of that. It's a price that we pay, but I think it's a price worth uh, to preserve democracy. Uh, also, economic sanctions. There are still companies that are doing business in Russia, specifically this local um, uh, Delaware, Ohio-based company, Greif, that uh, produces um, the uh, containers for uh, large buildings, production, etc. After Bucha uh, events came to a fore, I contacted again the CEO of the company, asking him if he would change his mind about doing business in Russia. And he said, we don't care about all this rape. So um, in more or less uh, about the same amount of words. So we need to put pressure on companies that are still doing business in Russia, because what they do, they contribute to blood money. They basically supply the war machine that keeps on killing civilians. We really need to work on completely cutting uh, Russia off. And for us individually, when we go shopping in a grocery store, or when we go to Amazon, we need to stop buying Russian products. Um, and Russians are really sneaky. They package their products. They don't use Russian language on them. Uh, they make it look like it's made somewhere else. Uh, so look for four six. Anything that starts with four six on the barcode is made in Russia. And uh, we need to also be mindful that when the war is over, there's going to be a lot of need still to rebuild everything. And so Ukraine would need. Uh, help in that, uh, but Russia should be held accountable as well. The reparations need to be uh, need to be paid um, individually. If you're interested, there is a mega site uh, called supportukrainenow.org, and this mega site has variety uh, of uh, different nonprofit organizations, including the Ukrainian military. Uh, website all on one in one place, and you can pick and choose where would you like to, uh, what would you like to support. Uh, so you can support the humanitarian aid, medical aid, um, sending food, uh, helping prosthetics. So it's whatever it is that you choose, you can choose. Uh, and last but not least, uh, psychological support, spiritual help, prayers do help. I hear reports of people uh, at the uh, at the fighting fields. Uh, when there's shelling and the shell falls down where they're, you know, they're hiding and it does not explode. Could be a coincidence, it would be some divine providence, and definitely collective prayers do help. Um, engage in rallies when the rallies are held to support Ukraine. Share posts about Ukraine. Uh, speak to people that you know, spread the, wor the word to others. Fly Ukrainian flags. It has been uh, extremely heartwarming and encouraging after the, uh, the war intensified in February, and I was a complete wreck, uh, especially the first week. Somehow I managed to teach all my classes. I guess that was a nice diversion. Uh, but the neighbors in my neighborhood started flying Ukrainian flags, and they're still flying uh, them. And it's, it really makes me feel so much better. It, it's a non-material thing, but I think it makes a difference. It, there are Ukrainians everywhere, and them seeing the flags uh, uh, being uh, flied by businesses and by individuals is, is really important. There were little kids who were drawing the pictures of, of Ukrainian army and giving it to me. The, the neighbors sent some flowers. So every little bit that definitely helps. And uh, basically, to conclude, you don't really have to be Ukrainian to help and to understand the plight that Ukraine is in. You just need to be human. Because Ukraine is fighting for human rights. It fights for freedom. Um, and unfortunately, it's a, it's a difficult fight that it's in. But without the help of the rest of the world, uh, I don't think Ukraine can be successful in that fight. Thank you. And I would entertain your questions now. One of the strong points you make is that the United States must continue to supply good quality military aid. We have been doing that, but to continue doing that, one would expect to see a ramp up of our production of ammunition and arms. <coughs> Do you see that happening at all? I wish I had a crystal ball on this one. Um, I would hope so. I think the writing was on a wall way before the February, and they should have started wrapping, you know, ramping this up, the production. And I'm hoping that they are. Maybe we just because, from what I understand, there are some weapons that U.S. is sending to Ukraine that 
we're not telling the world that we're sending it, which is a good thing. So I'm hoping that there is a production going on that we're not reporting to everyone. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what we really need to be doing. Wouldn't it have more psychological impact on Russia if we were reporting the production going on? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think the Russian mentality, uh, the way how the propaganda works and the way how people, I mean, Putin has 82% of people supporting his, his actions in Ukraine. Uh, and so the idea here, um, even before we started to support Ukraine, the way how Russia saw this long time ago, since 2004, is that the West is against Russia. The West is fighting us, and so I think if we start reporting it, uh, that probably just bumps up the whole patriotic thing. Oh, you know, the world is around us, so we need to fight even harder. Um, it could go either way. It could be, a, I don't think people would start uh, surrendering more. Um, it's a possibility. I would probably rate it as about 20% probability. But I would h place a higher probability on people saying, oh, you know, see that this is the West. This is really the West trying to subjugate the Mother Russia and put us to our knees. I think that would probably be a more likely outcome. But when the supplies of millet missiles and shells run out, and I see no evidence that production is being ramped up, what happens then to Ukraine? My question is, is the United States actually serious? I wish you could ask that question, your representative and the president. Because <laughs> I, wish, I wish I was in charge and I would be like, yes, let's build more HIMARS and javelins and ship them all to Ukraine. Because, you know, Russia is coming after us. In their mind, they're still living the world war, the, the, the Cold War still goes on for them. This is just continuation. So we're next. It's pretty well documented history, what happened before World War II and what happened during the Korean War. Do I see that happening here? Is the United States still the arsenal of democracy? We might still change our course, I think. I mean, it's not too late, I would like to think. But thank you for your questions. I don't know who was next. Ladies first, I guess. Thank you. I wanted to say something first and then a question. My mother lived through the Russian invasion into Germany. Many of her friends were killed by their own parents, the women, so they would not be raped. It's horrendous what they do. Second question. I have read that because we had such a debacle with Afghanistan, that that had pushed Putin to think that we are weak and that he can do what he's doing now. Do you think that's true? Um, on your first comment, um, if you have not read some of the horrible accounts of the uh, Russian army coming to Germany and hundreds of thousands of women being raped, you, you should read it. And unfortunately, Russians do not or do not want to see the, what they have done or admit what they have done. And it's a horrible. And it's just what they continue doing now in, in Ukraine. The second question, um, what happened in, in at least, the way how we withdrew from Afghanistan was a, was a disgrace. It was, it was not nicely done, to say the least. And I think everything that we do in the international arena, it sends a signal. Um, the signal first was sent in 2014 when uh, we didn't do anything, even though we did sign the uh, non-nuclear proliferation with Ukraine when it gave up its uh, nuclear weapons in exchange for, uh, in 1994, it was a Budapest memorandum um, in exchange for territorial integrity when no United States and no UK did anything. Well, Russia was also co-signer, but that doesn't matter. Whatever they sign doesn't matter. But you would think that whatever United States signs kind of matters. When we ignored that and didn't do anything, that sent the signal. When we withdrew so hastily and left our allies behind in Afghanistan, that sent the signal. So everything that we do anywhere sends a signal. And those people like Putin, like Kim Jong-un, from whom now Putin buys ammunition, uh, people like Xi Jinping, uh, they're all paying attention and they're all watching what's going on because they're taking lessons. They play in a long-term game. They're not playing four year until the next re-election game. They're playing, their horizon, planning horizon is hundreds of years. Um, talking about taking action, uh, 
uh, my wife and I have been very disappointed that none of the missiles that we're supplying are aimed anywhere into Russia. And second question, uh, Ukraine has the uh, plants for building missiles. Their technology isn't high enough yet. Do you agree with me that the U.S. should be supplying technology <coughs> that would be able to shoot a rocket 150 miles and hit Moscow? <laughs> My mom will cook borscht for two days if that happens um, for the neighborhood. Um, uh, so this is a wonderful question. Uh, and, and unfortunately, what I've heard from the ground that even the more advanced equipment that we're sending, so for example, some of those javelins, they have uh, uh, capacity of using the modern technology and GPS and do precise targeting of the, uh, of the, of the military targets. Uh, but before we give it to Ukrainians, we take off the sophisticated part, thus basically rendering the equipment, uh, sending it back to like 70s. Uh, rendering it not as, as effective. Um, and so the, the first supplies of the weapons that we've sent was an opportunity for Pentagon to clear uh, their bases of something that we didn't want to begin with. Uh, so note that not everything, so I had a retired colonel of the Air Force look through the list of things that we've been sending since March. Uh, and he said a lot of it is like, some of it almost includes like a pistols from 19th century. So the, that's why I mentioned the good quality and quantity. It's not just quantity, but the quality is important. So I'm hoping that, um, yes, that, the, that it would be possible to shoot more into the uh, Russian territory as now Ukrainian military is taking back the Ukrainian territory. Uh, but the conditions on which, or the, the capacity of the weapons that are given to Ukraine does not allow that yet. Uh, and so there is this conditions that we're gonna give you, but we only give you something with the range of 50 miles, or we're gonna give you with the range of 150 miles, but not 300, even though we have 300, but we're not gonna give it to you because we don't want to upset Putin. I think at this point we've upset him enough that I don't think we need to be dancing around him and trying not to upset him anymore. That should not be a, a consideration. What should be consideration is the strategy of the handling the war. Uh, if you can shell Russian territory, then it fuels up the rhetoric that now they're, they're, they're killing us, so let's use the nuclear weapons. In fact, some um, estimate that, uh, just like they did with Chechnya, so Russians in 94 didn't really care much about Chechens, and they were like, let the Chechens go, let them be self-determined, whatever, they can have their own republic. What changed the, uh, the relationship between uh, Chechnya and, and, and Russia there is that uh, Russian KGB, they bombed their own people in Moscow and that shifted the understanding of the war for regular population. The regular population was like, ooh, the bad Chechens are shelling us, and it was undercover operation by KGB. And that allowed then uh, Russians to do the carpet bombing and completely destroy Grozny, uh, which is the capital of, che of Chechen Republic, et cetera. That would just give them green, green flag. And so we have to be mindful of provocations where Russians shell themselves, which they will do. They don't care about their people. I spoke to Molotov's grandson, couple decades ago, and I asked him, well, there's a demographic crisis in Russia, people are dying, um, there's, this is a problem. And he's like, well, few tens of millions people less, more resources go for everyone. So there is no consideration for people. They will not stop, they will bomb their own people to make it look as if Ukrainians bomb the civilians, and then will kind of untie their hands to do anything now and have even more support of the general population. So the way how one would use the more effective weapons, you have to be really more careful and maybe advance, not just with shelling, but also have the shelling cover and movement of the troops to be able to protect the territory and to, to ensure that there is not as much provocation. So there's a lot of kind of military strategy that goes into it, and I'm sure Ukrainian army has been trained by American army, so they should, they should know how to properly do it. I'm not a military specialist, but there's a ways to do it properly. Shelling, uh, shelling the, the, the supply chain would be... Yeah, yeah, and just like try to be really specific in targeting, but you need to have sophisticated equipment to do so, to do the kind of surgeon-like precision um, and not making sure that you don't shell the civilian objects like Russians do. Yeah. yeah. 
Do you expect that there would be the insurrection within territories that have been reclaimed by Ukraine from the people that have Russian heritage? Um, if I had the crystal ball, I would own uh, an island in Caribbean. Um, I, the, just because someone has a Russian ethnicity does not, I think they've lived long enough in Ukraine and have tasted enough of the freedom to not want to go to totalitarian state, at least that's the hope. Um, right now we're seeing insurrections within the territory that's uh, controlled by, by Russia of people kind of engaging in partisan warfare, uh, kind of fighting the occupiers. I have not seen if something like this happens, you can be sure that this is something that's planned by Russian KGB and planted, um, planted spies. And just make no mistakes, uh, it's not just in Ukraine, but in Western uh, Europe, United States, and especially the UK, uh, there are Russian plans and Russian paid agents everywhere. And it's not really like they're not trained necessarily by KGB, but they have some blackmail uh, or money promised or both. Uh, and they're just sitting there waiting to, you know, just not necessarily blowing the bridges up, but just using their uh, friendship networks, just using their influence, using their money, which they only are able to have because Putin allowed them to have it. Uh, one of the 300,000 richest people in UK are actually Russian. And this is where they house their, their, they build their houses and super yachts and everything, and that's where they have those. So we need to be mindful that, um, speaking of resurrections or uh, insurrections or some kind of um, you know actions or protest of people going around with Russian flags, uh, they might be portrayed by Russian media as if they're you know, Ukrainians uh, or Ukrainian citizens that are fighting for the self-determination of the Russian language or whatever, but the chances are they're actually Russian citizens that have been planted there for a while. So we need to be um, cautious about what kind of source of information we'll listen to. So Russian TV probably wouldn't be a good source for that. One more question. Yeah. Um, after the withdrawal from Afghanistan and after it became apparent that the U.S. government doesn't want to anchor Russia, how long do you think it'll be until America decides to commit to defending Ukraine? Can you repeat the question? Uh, so the question was uh, how long before America decides to actually engage and do something given the past history with Afghanistan and not wanting to anger Putin? Did I transcribe your question? Um, I wish it would be sooner rather than later. Uh, I think the problem, I mean, the beauty of democracy is that we, we, we are kind of unpredictable. A lot of things could happen and we don't have the same person running the show. Uh, the other side of the, of the coin, of that same democratic coin, is that we kind of focus on the next elections. So a lot of people are talking, you know, what's going to happen in November? So if we put enough pressure on uh, electoral campaigns and people who are going to be elected, the, the change might come sooner. Uh, rather than later, uh, but it depends also what the economy is doing, what the, uh, what the inflation is doing, what's, what, what's going on. So depending which pressure is more acutely affecting either already elected uh, representatives or the ones who are running for the, for, the, for the seat. So I think we should use the, um, the mechanisms that this country has for trying to introduce the change. And unfortunately, it takes a while. Uh, to, to introduce this, I just hope that you know this upcoming election might be one of the first steps that we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stick around after the meeting. So if you would like to talk to me uh, in a more informal manner, I would be happy to to, to talk more and answer your, more of your questions. Thank, Thank you. I also would like to take an opportunity to thank you for being here today. And I have a certificate for you. What we do is, in honor of our guest speakers, we make a donation to a local not-for-profit. 
Um, but based on your, your content and your passion and your knowledge of all that's going on, we're going to adapt this. So I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to give you a different one <laughs> after we talk. And I'm going to ask you to tell us where you'd like the donation to go. So it can maybe go to help some Ukrainian Treasure effort. Zone. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That was wonderful. And Don, thank you for for bringing her to us today. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Woo